All right, um, so we're uh, live, and I'm just going to, my name is Kent C. Dots for anybody watching later, um, and I had some questions about um, doing continuous uh, delivery, deployment, integration, whatever you want to call it, um, and uh, Tanner and Derek, and somebody new who just wanted a shot. Yeah, What's Joe. your name? I'm Joe. Hi, Joe. I haven't met you, but I'm Kent. <laughs> um, but uh, these guys uh, work on a really cool products and have continuous deployment. You guys deploy like 10 times a day, right? Plus, yeah. Yeah, so awesome. We, um, yeah, I'd like to do that. So <coughs> why don't I, I'll, I'll give you guys a quick background of, of what I've got. And then you guys can talk about what you've got and that, yeah, probably help with context. So where I'm at right now, <coughs> uh, we deploy every two weeks. We have two-week sprints um, and then two weeks of Q&A or, or Q&A, uh, QA, um, and where we fix stuff. And then we deploy. Um, and so it's like customer wants something. It's going to take at least four weeks to get to them. Um, and this is not something that is desirable for us, um, so we want to do some continuous delivery stuff. But right now, our back end is a, um, a little bit monolithic. Um, our front end doesn't have a ton of test coverage. I think we're, uh, we just started working on it. We're about 50% now. And um, so, yeah, working on that. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's our our product, the front end is totally decoupled from the back end, which is nice, and so it's just REST. Um, the back end is all Java, and um, yeah, that's about it. So um, what about you guys? What's your setup like? So we're kind of the opposite in terms of you know our testing. Uh, right now, we do, we do very minimal deployment on the front end, and there's approximately 0% test coverage. <laughs> Whoa! Man, you're living on the edge. That's scary. Continuous deployment with no tests. Well, we also don't have uh, any customers on the platform yet either. So, except for ourselves. <laughs> so it's not too too scary yet. The yeah. back end is where we have we're probably sitting in the forty to fifty percent test coverage range. I don't know. Maybe that's a little generous, but we'll we'll go with that. Definitely generous. <laughs> um. And that's all written in Go. And depending on what, what is exactly it is we're working on, we'll end up deploying 10 to sometimes 100 times a day, depending on our dependencies. Mm -hmm. um, so we have it set up in CodeShip where we kind of have our core um, helper libraries. And anytime we deploy on that branch, uh, once that build passes, it'll branch out and it'll deploy, you know, I don't know exactly, 10 to 12 other repos that all rely on it as a dependency. And so, anyway, we'll, we'll get, whenever we push to that branch, we'll get a kind of a turbo code ship notification on our Slack channel on uh, whether or not the build process worked. So you have dependent uh, repos. You can, you can configure that in code ship. You say, hey, this, this repo depends on this one. When this one deploys, I want you to just kick off the build for this one, or? Um, it's, uh, kind of. Um, it's not quite that um, sophisticated. Um, it's really just they have a they let you inside of their API when you're in the local kind of SSH or in your local shell. You can restart a build on anything. So we just have a a little GitHub repo that's a shell script that runs, and we actually don't even use most a lot of the they kind of let you type in a little text box on their end and say okay run my test commands then you know then or run my build commands run my test commands and then you move into a deploy stage um we have most of that because most of our testing and everything is pretty consistent so we just have one shell script that kind of runs everything and then on any build it runs that and then on the deploy side, um, once it successfully passes, then in the deploy stage, we just say, okay, rebuild, 
you know, these X repos. Oh, uh, I see. So you, you, in your deploy, you use the CodeShip API to kick off the builds of the other uh, repos? Yeah, but it's, it's not even like a, re a REST API. You can just set a, an environment variable and say restart build. And so we just, in that, um, in that common shell script, we set all of our projects with their API ID, or with their code chip IDs. So then we can just say restart API or restart, you know, whatever uh, module it is. And then it kicks off that build. So how do you, uh, so let's see. So you don't actually automatically deploy whenever you commit to like your, your backend repo. You are manually doing that still um, with uh, just by kicking off this um, this common build is that how that works? No, each of the individual repos they build whenever we commit to them, or we have a couple of common repos that if we push to them, it builds itself and then kick restarts the last build of of those repos. Of anything that depends on that one. I see. Okay, but that's not something you configure in CodeShip. That's something you kind of manage yourself. Say, hey, this. Well, I'll get how commit um, all those commit that gets kicked off by the repo itself that's a built into code chip and they also have the ability we, we're not running um, separate dev and production it's we're just running kind of one um, one environment per module right now but they do have the option that's pretty simple to depending on which branch you're pushing to you can have it uh, do different deploys to different environments and whatnot. I see. So the, um, for us, we have, like right now, and maybe I should think, like, uh, we'll need to rethink this. But right now, when it's time to uh, finish a sprint, we will cut a new uh, release branch. So it'll be release slash you know, the sprint name um, or sprint number. Um, and then if we need to like make changes to that, we'll just commit to that uh, branch. And I saw that like you can uh, specify, hey, I want this build to only apply to branches uh, that match or that start with this name. Um, and like, how, do you know if there's a, a good way for me to control, um, um, uh, how, like what environment is a particular branch should go to and when? Because uh, like, or, or should should it just be like, master always goes to, um, to production, and then we'll have a QA branch or like, I don't know, am I making any sense? Yeah, I mean that probably sounds. I mean that's our plan for how once we go live, we're gonna have a a dev environment and a production environment that will, you know, our branching strategy will just say okay, any pushes to dev go to dev, and then anything to master will go to our production environment. Hmm. Okay. So I got a tweet from Florian Mot Mot Motlick, um, who said that he'd like to jump on um, this call real quick. So I'm going to see if I can invite him. Um, well, he'll know better than anyone else, because pretty sure he's the CEO there. Yeah, that's what he said. He's like, hey, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to help you. It's like, sweet. So just invited him. We'll see. I'll uh, tweet back at him. Be nice to have him helping to. Uh, and we'll see what uh, he has to say about this. But the way that we are actually doing our deploy using kind of those environment variables, it actually bypasses some of Code Ships, um, uh, their tier restrictions. Because we're on the lowest tier that allows one build at a time. Uh -huh. <laughs> when we kick off those ten or whatever, they just all build simultaneously. And we, when if you go into the UI at that point, it says it gives us ten error messages at the same time. Kind of nice. top of the screen, it says you can only build one at a time. Like, well, whatevs. Yeah, <laughs> it works, right? So yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm just, we're, we're really wanting to get continuous integration um, and continuous delivery 
going. I'm just trying to figure out like how how do we still factor in QA time and like what is what does QA even mean when I push code and ten minutes later it's in production? Like that's difficult. I think when you're when you're going from like a you know hey we're gonna do this two week sprint. You know, because that's, hey, okay, we have bugs, we're going to fix them, we're going to test them, we're going to get everything code reviewed and checked, you know. I mean, that process takes collaboration on from a ton of people, and you're smushing that down into 10 minutes. I mean, I don't, I don't know how that would even work either. I think that's, I mean, one of the benefits for us is that we just, not even really a benefit, but we just have such a small team, and we don't have customers yet, so we can do stuff like that. Also, we have, sorry. Okay. Yeah, Joe's gonna jump in. We again. we have separate separate packages that each of each of us is over. So there'll be some of them will be codependent, but uh, typically I'm working on stuff that just I'm working on, and Derek does stuff that that he's over. And when we do overlap, um, it's we're we're still making commits that don't break any of the tests that we've had set up for for all of our stuff. And so testing is probably the biggest that's, that's part the there. biggest key in all of that. GitHub had a pretty interesting post today on their engineering blog where they talk about how they don't I mean they're doing continuous integration and deployment and they don't have like unit testing really for their front end stuff. And they just said that they have really they've built kind of their custom sophisticated tooling for just user metric reporting and they use that as you know, kind of a public way to get any error reports. Um, so that's someone at scale who's, you know, doesn't have super great test coverage, especially from like a, you know, multiple browser, you know, checking for regression or anything. And anyway, it's a really good article. Yeah, that's interesting. I'll have to look at that. Because like, that seems to be against everything I've ever heard about continuous integration and deployment is like you need to have high test coverage and and like lots of tests to make sure you don't break anything when you push out and you deploy so looks like we got Florian hi Florian hey guys can you hear me yeah, yeah. thanks for coming on awesome yeah happy to so um, I'll, maybe I guess I'll just give you some context um, where I work uh, we have two week sprints then two weeks of QA and then we release I'm sure you Heard that story that's pretty common so we want to get to continuous deployment delivery um, but and I tried out coach Shep, Co coach shift this weekend on an open source project and it was amazing um, that's but, good <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I, I'm just wondering um, and, and talking with uh, Derek and Tanner about their process and uh, how how do we um, like our back end is a Java stack. We've got it's a little bit monolithic, uh, and then front end is totally decoupled from back end, just REST uh, API calls. And so, like implementing this on the front end should be pretty trivial. But how, like, um, how do I, um, um, like, it'd be a pretty significant difference. Uh, way to do things uh, to not have that two weeks of QA. Um, yeah. So like, how do I manage that? Yeah, so I think that's, um, I mean, there's two sides, like from a technical side and, and, and from, a, from a process side. And by the way, hey, hey to the other team here, hey, Tanner and um, yeah, thanks for, you know. oh, nice, nice, <laughs> nice, go on. Uh, thanks for being customers <laughs> and, and spreading the word. That's really helpful. Um, yeah, so I, I think in terms of the technology, uh, one question is um, the JavaScript and the Java code in different repositories, or is it the same yeah. repo? Different repos. Different, sort of completely independent from each other, and completely different deployment strategy, different yeah. hosting provider, everything different. Okay. Well, right now, uh, maybe some context. Right now, we're building everything with Jenkins, and um, only one of us knows much about Jenkins. Um, yep. I, I, That's I'm, how it goes. I understand my build pretty well, um, but once it gets into actually like deploying and different things like that, I like I don't get that. But in like less than an hour, I was able to set up a brand new project and deploy it to the World Wide Web like super yep. fast on Codeship, and it was so easy, and I totally get it. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, just in, in terms of the process, so something that is very um, fundamental to how we think about deployment in general is what we call repository-driven infrastructure, which basically means you should never, as a developer, when you want to deploy something somewhere, think about the step of deployment. What you should think of is like, I move code from this branch into this branch, and then magic happens, and it ends up in whatever environment I'm in. That could be, for example, like you have a feature branch, you merge it into master, and like the build runs, and then it just gets deployed to staging. And so th that's what some people do. Like some people, uh, and as we do, like push master through to to um, production directly. But even other people, what they do is they have like the master branch gets deployed to a staging or QA environment or whatever. And then once you merge from master into a specific production branch, um, that triggers the deployment into production, for example. Like that's a very easy way to have like still a man kind of manual deployment that doesn't happen every time you push to master, but whenever you just need it to. Um, but everything is automated through the repository, triggered through the repository, handled by, by CodeShip, and especially in a way that uh, makes it easy for anybody to understand because you just go into CodeShip, into the UI, and see like the commands that ran. And on the other hand, it makes it very easy for anyone to be onboarded, because, and, and that's something that we found. Like my, my go-to example for that is our DNS system gets deployed through CodeShip. Like we basically have a JSON file that gets pushed into the DNS simple um, um, API. And so the first day um, that somebody new joined um, and they wanted to do like some DNS changes in the first week, I, I didn't have to tell them about DNS simple or anything at all. I just needed to point them to the repo and say like change this JSON file and like get it to like a pull request, get it to be reviewed and merge into master. And then it just goes out into our DNS system. And you don't have to know anything about our production infrastructure at all. All you need to worry about now is like the code and anything else can be handled by the system automatically just through the repo. So they don't even have to understand really the process. They only have to understand like the repository, which they work in all day anyway. That's really in terms of like deployment, and that's how you can easily do like different stages of deployment. Or even go further and do so something that we support, started uh, like built recently, or a couple of months ago, is um, a wildcard, or basically that you can, in for a deployment branch, you can say, okay, hey, deploy the master branch every time, or deploy a branch that starts with this. So you could say, like, for example, um, branches and tags are handled the same way. So if you say, okay, I want to deploy this feature branch into my QA environment, you say, okay, you create a deployment that's like whenever you start something with QA slash, then deploy it here, and then you could just put a tag on it. You could name the tag like QA slash release this feature or something like that, or like review for this feature. And then that could go out into um, your your staging environment or your QA environment very easily. And still, everything is handled. You have the whole history. That's also something nice if you like trigger deployments and everything through the repo, is you have full history of everything that happened, because it's basically like code moving through your repository. Um, and that, that really helps. Like That also helps teams that are more accustomed to like a a bi-weekly or weekly or whatever um, deployment process to move slowly into, okay, let's do daily on staging or like every time we push to master on staging, re whenever we want to like to QA for feedback on a specific branch. And then like let's move to like weekly merges from master to production. And then like every two days from master to production. And and eventually you can move to like, okay, let's deploy all the time. Cool. Okay, and that's that's the eventual goal, right? It's just like I push something, it goes into master, and and the only way um, that I've, well, until a few minutes ago, the only way I thought that actually worked was um, having high test coverage and very good tests. Is like, um, but Derek mentioned a, a post from GitHub that kind of was a, a different approach or um, didn't have. High test coverage. Have you seen it work without test coverage, or like, is there a, a different I, approach? I think so. I think I mean I, I'd be interested in that post. Um, so I I don't think I've seen that post. So if you could send that, um, that'd be great. Um, generally, I think the the problem with no uh, test or with not enough test coverage is that you'd never really know. Um, especially if you want to move to like constantly deploying, basically, um, there's just no like it'll just slow you down. Like mm -hmm. investing in test coverage is something that definitely helps over time. But I think that's something that also has to be built up over time. So it, it's not right. necessarily, um, and, and I've had a couple of blog posts um, I can send you um, a while ago, like basically how to get started with testing. And I think the important part is setting up the workflow. Like once you have the whole CI workflow going, and like it runs on every push, and, it, and it's scalable, and just it works, 
um, and you have like one, like even teams that have no tests at all. Like I, what I'm telling them typically is, pick any tool. It doesn't matter which tool you use today. Like it doesn't have to be the same tool you'll use in a year. Like pick any tool, write one test case, and set up the whole CI process. Because then all the excuses of like it isn't set up, it isn't really running, like that all goes away, and you're just mm -hmm. writing like start writing a second test, and then also like you can have more of a question in the team, like, okay, why are you not, like, we have all this nice process and these tools in place, like, why are you not writing a test when you want this feature in? And, like, you can just say, okay, like, this PR just doesn't get merged unless there's, like, a test for that. And I think, so that's how you can get started um, and, and move faster and faster um, okay. on that. And I think that's just, uh, thanks for the, the, the link to the blog post. Definitely will read that. Yeah, but I think that, that over time, the problem is that over time, um, if you don't have like an automated way to check that your application works, you you just naturally get slowed down because mm -hmm. you, you can't check everything or like either you get slowed down or you'll break the application for your customers constantly. But it's also it needs to be. It I think I've seen many teams that have no tests and then wanted to like and then go in and write like thousands of very low level tests uh, and spend weeks on just getting that in place, which isn't really that necessary in my opinion. Um, because I think that like starting with very high level tests and then moving down the stack um, makes sense. Cool. I, I had another question. So I, I'm thinking that what would work for where I am is we have a, a branch for production and we, we have actually four environments. Uh, we actually probably only need three. So we have dev, QA, and prod that are really necessary. So I, I think the easiest transition is uh, dev is deployed from master anytime there's a change. Uh, QA is um, a branch and prod is a branch. And then at the end of our two week sprint, we um, um, we merge all of the changes we made in, in master to QA. And then at the end of, uh, or when we're ready to release, we merge QA into production. Is that a good way to go about it? That definitely sounds, that sounds perfectly fine. So, so what, what about actually the transitional? I think especially as like when everything is to, or not necessarily transitional. I think some teams will just stay with that workflow because that's exactly what works for them, which is also mm -hmm. fine. You just as long as it's completely automated from from like for every step, and at least you have the choice in the future, and you're not blocked by by deployment taking up time. Yeah, yeah. So I I definitely think that like our goal is to eventually deploy on commit, but. Um, yeah, for transitional, I think that'd be a good thing. Uh, so then, what about uh, protecting the production branch? Like, um, I, I trust the developers here for sure, but um, I could see, you know, we hire a junior and they're getting started and then they just blow things up. How do I protect my production branch? So that's something, I mean, you can definitely, on a technical level, work around it, and that's something that we're definitely going to work on in the future as well, like to have, like somebody has to sign off, for example, before we yeah. really run deployments. But that's a future feature for us, especially with larger teams. Um, so far, I think that is more of, like I haven't really seen that happen. Or like sometimes maybe you, and, and you can stop any build. Like typically what people do is like when they <clears throat> merge into production and release to production, like they know it immediately, so you just stop the build and code chip while the tests are running. So typically no deployment happens. Um, I think that's extremely rare, and especially that it happens um, like on accident. Um, that's, I, th I think building the process around that will just slow you down as well. So I think that, I think it's not that big of an issue as okay. a lot of people think, in my experience. And that can be different. But I think it also helps like naming that branch. I think what some people have done is like they haven't named it specifically production. But if you name the branch like and some of them have like test and master and then master goes to production, which is hard to understand. But if it's like specifically production or production dash do not merge. Right. Something like like you <laughs> could, like there there are things where like it, it it can't really happen on accident. Like it's so obvious that like that this should not be the what you should be doing right now that it has to be malicious. And I think, and, and we're definitely going to work on things like that for the future because it's just some companies need that in terms of their, their internal processes and stuff like that. Um, but I think the, the most, like the easiest way to work around it is just making sure the branch is named something that you really, really can't miss and you have to be willing to go in. Like, yeah, name it do not merge dash production. Or something like that. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Hard uh, to have an accident. And that junior dev is only going to make the mistake 
once. Yeah, that's yes. a good point. And because you have your you know continuous deployment set up, you know even if you messed up and it got all the way through to production, you know chances are, you know you're going to find out real quick, and then you can just roll back and um, you know push the other one unless it's taking hours for you know your JavaScript gulp file to run. Yeah. You know, yep. Exactly. It's, it's yeah. very unlikely that it has a long-term impact. Is there a way for me to get a notification in HipChat or something uh, when a build starts, or just when it ends? Um, both. So if you have right. notifications in Slack, you'll get when it starts, when it ends, the result, and all that kind of stuff um, oh. in, in HipChat and, and Slack and many different other systems. Cool. OK. Um, so also, let's see. I, I'm thinking that branches are probably the better way to do it, but I was just kind of exploring in my mind. What um, you mentioned that tags work the same way, which makes sense. Um, would it, like an alternative would be to just have a tag for production and move that tag? Um, is that advisable or not advisable for anybody? Um, if if I think you can totally do that as well. I personally prefer like you could do like production slash and name it something. I personally prefer a branch for that simply because it's easier to understand. Right. It it works totally the same. I think it's. If if you're more comfortable with that workflow, that's totally fine. Um, I just I have a hard time. Like tags are hard to manage, mm -hmm. generally. I think in, like if you want to release often, like with GitHub and all that stuff, like tags are not as visible as branches and even locally in Git. So that's why I prefer a branch. Um, and also like the nice thing about branches is there can only be like one latest. Like it's it's e just easier to understand in a branch. Um, than than with a tag because it's like then two people push to the same tag and so you don't know which one exactly was like pushed last and or I mean you can find out but it's right well know. actually so here's another question about branches I think uh, like I don't think I'll do tags that's kind of that doesn't mm -hmm. really make sense um, but uh, one thing that we struggle with here is, with our current setup is um, we have Jenkins build anytime a branch starts with release slash um, and so it'll build a release build and and deploy out our like start out our deploy process, which is junk. Um, but uh, so with the uh, um, with CodeShip and, and these branches, like, but well, so right now we make a branch for every sprint, and it represents that sprint's work. Um, if I do the same thing with CodeShip, um, I think I'd probably run into the same problem where um, we we branched. But we haven't actually deployed last branch's stuff to production yet, and so okay. in the, that couple of days, let's say I, I branch and then I make a change to that branch, and then I say, "Oh wait, the thing that's going out this weekend has a bug. I need to change that." And so then I, I commit and push that, um, and so I get a new uh, version of that release, and that's the one that's coming out this weekend. But then I can't push a new, um, I can't push anything to the branch that I just branched yesterday because. Then it would overwrite my build from uh, for this weekend. Like it's it's really confusing. Um, is there a, like a good solution for that, or is it just like you should have your QA branch is just your your thing that's going out next, and and it's always that, and you don't have a history of what uh, I don't know, like different older branches of different releases. I think um, that's confusing. But. Yeah, I think it, it depends on. I mean, so there's this. Um, have you looked into the the Git flow or GitHub flow model? Yeah, of, I've yeah. looked into it a little bit. We don't really use it, but um, I'm not opposed to it. Yeah, so that's. I mean, there's the GitHub flow model, which I think works better for like, like where you specifically have like a named um, version or release for something, where like you have your own branch, then you do a release branch, you work on that release branch, and then at some point it goes out. I think so. Something that that GitHub. Like described on top of that was GitHub Flow, which makes which something that we use as well. Basically, it's you have the master branch. We branch away from master for every feature, so we do feature branches for everything basically. And as soon as like the feature is ready, we merge it back into into master and then it goes out. Another way would be, for example, to have like a a master and a dev branch. So like so production master and and then dev. So everybody like whenever the sprint is ready. Um, or like a new sprint starts, you branch uh, from master into either a named sprint or into dev. So that's the like sprint thing. Then everybody can go from that, work on their features, merge it at any point into that sprint branch, um, if you want that history, and, and work on that. Um, and then merge it back into master as soon as you're ready on that. And then master is the thing that is 
so, so master is always the same basically as production, um, even while the sprint is going. So you could put anything on master, see that it works, like for uh, quick fixes, and then release it out to, to production, and then basically rebuild that, that sprint, that whole sprint build, or like just merge it back in. But yeah, that gets, that whole thing gets kind of confusing pretty quickly. So that's why I personally I prefer a like master and like do feature branches away from master and then put it back into master, have master go just out to staging. And then whenever you want to release, just take it from staging and put it into production. Um, unless you really need that history, unless you really need like a specific branch that is only there for a specific sprint. Um, if you need that, then then that's yeah, like you need a different model, but that just makes it a little bit more complex. And I think that yeah. most teams who do continuous delivery don't, don't need that history. I think yeah. that history is really not like we haven't really used it a lot um, even now that we have it. So. And, and you can just put tags on there. Like you can say, okay, hey, tag this commit. That's like first commit for a new um, for a new sprint or something like that. Yeah. And that 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 makes that makes sense. That works. And especially like, I think when you move to more and more to continuous delivery, having like these kind of release branches where you cut the release and then like you have a release branch that you might want to put like that that whole workflow. I think I've seen it break down pretty much immediately as soon as people move to like deploying several times a day, because just managing your Git repository takes so much time from that moment on that it's just really hard um, to, to to get something out the door, basically, because it's just so overwhelming. And, and uh, there's certainly teams who have done it and that it works for, but I have, I've seen people struggle with that as well. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I think that, that makes sense. Um, I feel like I had another question. Oh, yeah, so on, on pull requests, um, this is another thing. Like we have a, a backend team here who's really, really smart at Java, and they're pretty good at JavaScript. But um, I, I guess I have a high standard or something. Um, so um, I, I want to. I, it would be really cool if if I could have it um, instead of CodeShip to actually deploy their pull request to some environment where I can play around with it without having to pull it down uh, locally, uh, and then like CodeShip. Uh, I'd, I'd have a code coverage report on that pull request, and and uh, this is all in, in uh, anticipation that we're going to be moving to GitHub uh, Cloud, so we'll be able to have like code coverage reported on that pull request, and, and um, I'm assuming, like, or if I understand right, uh, CodeShip also has some integration with the pull request on GitHub to say the build passed or failed, is that right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so would it be easy for me to? Um, to build every pull request and deploy it to some uh, environment on S3 or something, because it's all just JavaScript, um, and, um, and do things that way? Would that be an easy thing to do? Yeah, you could basically, you could set up a deployment. So uh, if you follow a specific naming um, convention, so for example, uh, if you, like, you work on master, like everybody works um, on master, either deploy master directly, or you say, okay, everybody works on, like starts branching away from master if they work on a new feature. And they call it feature slash slash something. So you have a naming convention for that feature branch. Um, and then you could say in the UI, like, okay, deploy each branch that starts with feature and deploy it into some bucket and, or a subfolder of a bucket that is named like the branch. Um, you can just write your own, like, you'd have to write your own script around that um, to make that work. But, but that would totally work. Um, so you can deploy every feature branch constantly, basically, um, into, into S3. Um, so it's in S3. And, and I think that's something that we like as well. Like, whenever somebody, something gets merged into master, um, we want there to be a code review. Like, I never want to have code in master that hasn't been reviewed by somebody else. So that's something that I personally, like, that, that we follow. So that's, we all work on, on, on feature branches um, okay. all the time. So nobody can, can just push directly into master. Like, merges into master only happen through GitHub pull requests. Which makes it nice because, like, there you have all the code review, you have all the tooling, all that kind of stuff, and nobody ever really works on master. Everybody only works on on feature branches, and oh, that, yeah, both can can be deployed easily. That makes sense. Um, and then um, I haven't actually gotten a pull request to my uh, open source library that's using CodeShip yet, mm -hmm. but. Uh, uh, I'm assuming that CodeShip has that same kind of integration that Travis CI has, where it'll like show the status of the build and that kind of thing. Is yeah, right? so we yeah we have so we we pushed uh, the the status API. Um, so if if the pull request so basically whenever you push to a branch, 
um, will run that build and push this to the status API of that specific commit, and then the pull request will just take like the latest status from the latest build. Um, that only works for like the same repository. If you have a fork, um, so we don't run builds automatically for a fork of your repository. We only run it for the main repository that you that you've set up. You can set up the fork then on CodeShip as well, of course. Um, so the core, the fork itself um, runs on CodeShip and and is set up through that. Um, but it's not automatically taking like if a pull request from externally comes in um, from a fork, uh, for example, for open source stuff. Um, it doesn't automatically build it. Um, but that's something that we we find very interesting and and, and might be able to or might build in the future. Yeah, that would be a really great feature for my open source stuff for sure. Yes, um, probably. Definitely. Less important for my um, like actual project here at work because uh, like everybody nobody's going to fork this repository. So. Yeah, that's that's been exactly our well that nobody really or very few people works in, in for like private mm -hmm. repositories. Um, so that's why we haven't focused okay. on that um, so much. Cool. I think you've given me a lot of uh, really good uh, good direction. This, this is cool. I mean, I think your yeah, let me issue, Kent, is going to be overcoming team um, you know, pushback. Because you're going to have to... I don't know that there's any way to really do continuous deployment while having your QA team exactly the same and you know, then having two weeks to look over everything. Like, to me, it's, it's more of an organization team rather than... I mean, the technical part's super easy, code ship simple. But it's figuring out how to get your team away from, oh, well, we have to have this, you know, this tag branch, or, oh, what do we do if our QA doesn't look at it, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think the, the organization from a business standpoint is really on board with the continuous integration. Um, and I think if we do the, uh, like, if we just start out with this exact same workflow, just using a different product, CodeShip, instead of Jenkins, uh, and then we slowly close the gap. Okay, so instead of two weeks, you're going to have a, a week and a half, and then it's just a week, and now it's just a couple days. And um, they'll feel more comfortable with it as our test coverage grows um, and uh, start doing end-to-end -end tests a little more as well. Um, but I think you're right. I, like that's that's the biggest hurdle I'm I'm looking forward to not really um, overcoming. And uh, we're we're going to have an architecture meeting about this in a week. I wish it was today. Um, to uh, to start doing stuff like this. Our ops guys are super excited about this, though. They can't wait to stop managing Stash and uh, Jenkins and everything. The, the, getting the ops guys on board is really important as a first step. Um, that that really helps. Um, yeah, I think in, uh, totally agree. I think it's a process. I think that, that needs to be rolled out over time. And I think what is important is having small wins, like having constant small wins, like, OK, this thing got a little nicer. This got a little easier. This got a little easier. Um, even before, like, reducing the two-week cycle, just, like, putting all the, like, everything in place so that the two weeks, that it feels already so much more productive during the two weeks. And as a last step, like, basically slowly reducing and reducing and, hey, let's try, like, one one sprint, like, for a week instead of, or, like, for, I don't know, eight days or nine days instead of, like, two weeks. Or, like, let's do, an, let's do it on a Wednesday instead of on, on next Friday. Something like that. I think that really helps, but yeah, these li li very little and small wins and, and constantly. Like, to be constantly reminded of, like, hey, this is so much better, so much better, so much better um, every time. That, that, that That's what we've seen what, what has worked in, in, in many different companies, yeah. So that's definitely um, great feedback from, from the others. Cool. Well, I think that's everything I wanted to, uh, earlier in our conversation, we do have a bug that our current deployment process uh, kind of exploits a little bit. Um, I was telling Kent that we have we have a, kind of our our utility repo that a lot that is a dependency for a lot of our other repos. And whenever we rebuild that one, we rebuild eight to ten repos, I think. Mm -hmm. And anyway, just so you know, that bypasses the concurrent build limit. So we the build restart bypasses the concurrent build limit. Yeah. Interesting. So, anyway, for what it's worth, and then we get like 10 error messages that are all stacked on top of each other that say, you know, you can only build one at a time, you know, you've exceeded your build limit, upgrade your plan, and it has 10 flags at the top of our screen. Interesting. 
I didn't, I, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if we're aware or just ignored it, or if we are not aware of that. Because it sounds like something that we have talked about in the past, and I think we just said very few people will know about this, so let's fix this later. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> because it's not negative; it's just it's a positive, actually, as you said. Oh yeah, I mean, it doesn't bother us. Yeah, yeah, no, I I can understand. Um, but yeah, that one we got a turbo build. His coach up goes because all of our builds <laughs> at the same time. And you do that through the API, basically, then, or like through the API and restarting the build. So how do, are you doing it? That's not through the REST API. That's just through the setting the environment variable, and then in in our de, in the deploy uh, script, we say restart build. I think. Yeah, yeah, but through the like, but through the API, like the restart build pings our API and restarts the builds in different projects, or. Yeah. Or different you, yeah. Yeah, so you're not pushing like you're not pushing new builds to GitHub or something, but you're just restarting like the latest. Right, it's just the the code ship CLI command. Yeah. Restart build. Yeah, got it. Yeah, interesting. No, I didn't know that. I'll 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 definitely forward that to the team. That sounds like an an, an interesting thing that we should look at probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I'm like the more we talk about, it, I'm pretty sure that's something that we discussed in the past and said like, well. <laughs> It's not going to be an issue or anything, like and not not negative. Let's just leave. Sure. It. Best case, <laughs> somebody finds it. It's a good thing for them. And it won't. Yeah. Happen. <laughs> cool. But yeah, good to know. <laughs> now my conscience is clear. Yeah, <laughs> you've at least confessed. To it. That's awesome. But that's that's fine. That's fine. Cool. Okay. Um, I think I think I had all my questions uh, answered. I think I know the direction that I want to go, and I want to do it right now, but. We got sprint stuff to do, so. <laughs> yeah, let me know. Um, if any questions come up, obviously let me know. Um, let our support know. Um, we're pretty fast on that one. Um, it can. Oh, actually, I did have another question. Uh, sure. So, have you seen most people when they start doing continuous deployment, like they deploy several times a day? Um, does that change the agile methodologies of, of Dev Shops? Like, do they switch from sprints to just Kanban and? Take the next thing on the top. Is that more logical for this scenario? I, I think so. I mean, we definitely did, and um, we had like a sprint-based model. But I think like sprints and like deploying ten times a day, just at some point, like it doesn't make any. Like you're you're just doing the sprint. Like you have the sprint management overhead, but you're not really getting anything out of it. Um, I think it definitely like having reviews or something, and like having like biweekly reviews and saying, okay, what did we ship last two weeks? Um, so we we do a, a weekly team meeting generally. Where like just our VP engineering or like engineering is just presenting like what happened last week and like what what new stuff did we put out um, that that really helps. But the high level stuff like we don't not everybody needs to know every small thing that we ship. Um, but like the high level stuff okay of like okay this happened in last week um, from like engineering and product. But yeah, I think that a sprint um, just at some point like you're planning for like what we found is like. After two weeks, you sit there and, and say like, okay, what did we deploy like 11 days ago? And then you just look through the GitHub blocks, and nobody really cares anymore. So they think that's you can always go back to the history. So we have all the logs always there. Like that's why commit messages are really important, just to be able to go back and see, okay, this happened. Um, but other than that, I think that yeah, sprint-based model. If you have daily releases or like constant releases, basically. At least we've we've gone away from it and moved more to a Kanban. I mean, Kanban-like. I think nobody's really doing Kanban or a sprints or whatever exactly like they were defined. Like everybody does their kind of version of it, but it's definitely more Kanban. Um, oh, you know what? You just made me think of something uh, sort of related. Um, so here we're using Jira. There's probably a zero percent chance we move from that. And I I actually I've been warming up to Jira a little bit. Uh, don't tell anybody. Just. <laughs> But uh, so one thing uh, that I kind of doubt you have but would be super awesome is if there was integration with Jira and CodeShip that said, like, on the Jira ticket, like, this has been deployed, and here's the build for it. That would be way, way, way cool. Yep, absolutely. Uh, we definitely want to integrate that in, like I said, notification tool or something like that in the future. Um, but it should be, like, for people that want to use it now, it should be, I guess, easy to trivial to script it yourself. Um, at least for now, and yeah, if you want to work on that or like have something to share at some point or just talk to our support with that, like we are, we have like a a, a script um, repository 
um, where we have these kinds of, of scripts in, uh, like other notifications for Liquid Prado, like integrations that we want to have, but we like there's a limited amount of time we can spend on building those integrations, like deep into the product. So that's why you can always run them as like a, a post um, build, um, like kind of deployment or like as a as a as a script uh, after the build. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something that you can can do and just just run your own script. Basically, put the, the token in your environment variables, run a script that updates Jira with exactly the information that you need. Um, you have all the information in like the build number, all this kind of stuff, and can get the even the URL of the build. Um, you have it in an environment variable, so you can push all of that into Jira. So it's not automated. We definitely want to do that, especially because, in our opinion, like continuous delivery has a technical side to it, but also a communication side to it. Like that's you need to solve both problems. Um, and if you only solve the technical problem, I think that's just not far enough, and that's the direction that we want to go. Like solving the technical one, and then we have a lot of stuff coming up that will like get get us closer to like solving the whole technical side, basically. Um, but also solving the communication issue. Like the product people in your team should be able to just look into Jira and see what happened without having to ping um, an engineer because or support. Like I don't want my engineering team to constantly have to like answer questions of like support. Um, Product um, marketing of like, did this get deployed? Did this get deployed? Did this get deployed? Um, that should automatically happen. Like this, this information should be spread throughout the team um, automatically, and that's that's definitely the goal that we're working towards. Yeah, that'd be awesome. If if I could get it to like actually close the ticket for me, yeah, that would be sick. So I think just in terms of like, in the end, like we give you a VM and whatever you want to run in that VM. Is totally up to you. So it's it's definitely absolutely if if you can somehow connect into that Jira um, in terms of if it's if it's just on the web, um, mm -hmm. it's definitely possible. Um, you just have to script it for now yourself. But I'm I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure there must be a million scripts out there um, doing that, and I assume it's pretty easy. So it wouldn't be hard. If you have a full node environment. One post deploy tool that we're going to start using is uh, RunScope. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're familiar with, but yeah. Are you familiar with that, Ken? No. Yeah. Anyway, it's more applicable to like an API rather than front end, but you can set up kind of a test suite of actual API calls and expected JSON responses. So instead of kind of building integration tests in house, you actually have run scope, send it all in externally, and and you know they'll run that whole test process for you. And so kind of what our plan is is to deploy, run. The, these run scope tests that are actually hitting the, the, our real API, and then if those fail, then roll back that deploy. Hmm. And, and you script it all through Kochi, basically. So you have one deployment script that does all of that. Is that correct, or? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely the position that we want to be in. Like we see ourselves as like driving the whole workflow, and it, it's really a workflow tool. And whatever services you want to integrate, um, you should be able to do that on your own. Um, and we want to integrate with like a selection of them over time, just yeah. to make it easier and easier and easier. So on on the SSH access, I was wondering, can like this is the the de facto standard of how much control do I have? Uh, can I do rm dash rf slash? No. No. <laughs> no sudo. So how how much how much control do I have on that? Uh, no no sudo access. Um, in in the machine, I'll send you an email afterwards um, with um, future developments. Okay, because um, for for me it doesn't matter quite as much. Like my my stuff is so easy to deploy, but I know that that's probably a battle I, I'll have. Is like right now we've got pseudo access on our Jenkins stuff. Um, what are we going to have to work around or give up by not having pseudo access? Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Can can't go into more details on air, but I'll send you as an email, um, both of you, both teams, um, with a little more details of what the future is, and where we're going with it. So, and you'll be excited about that. <laughs> Sounds good. Cool. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, one quick thing, because you've seen the shirt. I hope you guys, you uh, can you already ordered shirts for your team. I actually I left a review as um, requested in the email I got, and um, I will hopefully be getting a shirt soon. Yeah, so yeah, codechip.com slash swag. Um, you can get shirts sent to you, um, or, and the package of shirts. And we're currently we're doing new stickers right now. So the old ones are pretty cool. The new ones are 
really, really cool. Um, I can't say more because my market team, marketing team would hate if I just spoiled the surprise, but the units <laughs> are really awesome. We just got a couple of them in the office. They're really, really fun. Um, so yeah, it'll be out um, soon as well. And yeah, you can order all of that for free, of course, um, through coachip.com slash swag, and we'll send you a swag package. Cool. So one other question I was just curious. Uh, how big is CodeShip as far as employees? So we're, if you count all freelancers and everybody working on it, we're about 30 people. Um, so and yeah. we've been growing um, quite a bit. I think we, no, we, we more than tripled over the last nine months, I think. So we've been hiring a lot, um, growing a lot, um, hiring a lot more. Um, today, some, somebody new starts, <laughs> for example. Where, where are you based, and, and where are you hosting uh, all of your servers? Um, so AWS uh, East for servers. So we run on Heroku for the website, and the build servers are all AWS East. Um, and all of the other infrastructure is also basically AWS and, and, and AWS East. Um, and so we are we're based. So we started in Vienna, where all the Austrians, like the founding team is, and we moved to Boston as the headquarter. Um, so the headquarter is in Boston. Um, we have people in Boston and now somebody in Austin. We have people in Vienna still, and a couple of people remotely um, all over Europe, basically, as well. So we basically try to stay, in terms of the time zone, we try to stay like in the seven hours between like Texas and Vienna. Like That's roughly the time zone um, that we want to stay in. And, and But but then, um, if people want to work wherever or in one of our offices there, um, that's fine. And we fly people like between the continents and like in, in, in Europe or in the US to the offices regularly. Cool. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks a lot for jumping on, Florian. Really uh, appreciate your um, guidance on that. Yeah, happy. Let me know. Um, yeah, send me an email. I, I, I'm not sure if I have your emails. Could you just send me an email to uh, both of you to flow at cochip.com so I can send you more details um, around everything else? Because I What's don't the have address it. again? Flow, F L O, at cochip.com. Okay. If you could just send me an email so I have your email. And then I'll send you more info of where we're heading and, and what the future is. And, and if you have any questions, reach out to me, reach out to support anytime. Thanks. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Have a good one. Bye bye. Bye.